hi guys welcome to our youtube channel gum sapi this was hosted by the gum medical students association including me and my colleagues who are uh, who have qualified to enter the medical faculties of sri lanka after doing the edibles and the main reason that we decided to start this uh, youtube channel was to help you guys to face your exam successfully uh, at this moment of crisis the covid 19 pandemic that we all are facing and you guys are unable to attend your classes to complete your syllabus so uh, this video will be on uh, unit 9 microbiology and i'll mainly discuss the topics cyanobacteria uh, fungi and then uh, molecules protists viruses viroids and prions so starting off with cyanobacteria what actually are cyanobacteria uh, you guys may already be familiar with cyanobacteria as blue greens now why actually are they called blue greens uh, the blue green color of it the specific blue green color of it is due to the chlorophyll pigments present within the cyanobacteria and the cyanobacteria have many uh, cellular forms many shapes many sizes so when looking into the uh, cellular forms there are two main types of cellular forms of cyanobacteria one is unicellular and the other is colonial. Now, considering unicellular, what do you mean by unicellular? Unicellular in the sense, unicellular, which means a single cell. On the right hand side, you can see the microscopic view of some unicellular cyanobacteria within their mucilaginous capsules. Uh, after the cell division, this separates into two completely different cells. They can be identical but they are not physically connected with each other. They are two individual cells. So they are known as unicellular and they function individually. Uh, some kind of unicellular protists, uh, the daughter cells, the newly produced daughter cells, they release a mucilage-like substance. So the newly produced cells can be found within a mucilage capsule. Uh, in an instance like this, such a uh, number, uh, number of unicellular uh, protists can be uh, unicellular cyanobacteria sorry unicellular cyanobacteria can be found within this mucilaginous capsule and uh, on the other hand colonial in this colonial form the uh, individual cells are linked with each other physically mostly through the cell wall or they can be suspended in a gelatinous matrix so they are connected and they interact with each other and uh, mainly there are two types of uh, colonial forms one is the filamentous and the other one is non-filamentous on the top right you can see the microscopic view of some colonial non-filamentous cyanobacteria and on the bottom right you can see the microscopic view of some colonial filamentous cyanobacteria uh, the filamentous uh, cyanobacteria are formed when cell division process takes place on one plane and the newly added cells are added all in one direction so a long chain is formed uh, which is giving a filamentous like appearance to it and on the other hand the non-filamentous types uh, in this one the cell division takes place via many planes and cells are added in all directions so it can result in various kinds of shapes such as globular uh, then it can be second globular and spherical or it can be cubical or just randomly some random shape uh, next moving on to the general characteristics of cyanobacteria uh, cyanobacteria also have a phototrophic mode of nutrition similar to all other green plants and algae uh, phototrophism in the sense means uh, it uses the energy of the sunlight and the carbon from inorganic carbon dioxide to carry out its uh, food production process or photosynthesis and next most uh, most of the cyanobacteria have the nitrogen fixing ability for example nostoc nostoc is a cyanobacterium which is a free nitrogen fixer it's able to fix nitrogen uh, without involving in any kind of symbiotic relationship by itself that's what you call free nitrogen fixation and then next the anabina as well it's a symbiotic association and both these varieties get together in a symbiotic relationship and they involved in this nitrogen fixing process this nitrogen fixing process is uh, actually assisted by a special enzyme known as nitrogenase 
and the nitrogen fixing process occurs inside a special kind of cells known as heterocysts. These heterocysts are found within the uh, cyanobacterium. The nitrogenase enzyme is found within this heterocyst. That's the main reason why the nitrogen fixation occurs within these heterocysts. Uh, now, the fact is, uh, nitrogenase enzyme has a very high affinity towards oxygen. So, to prevent this nitrogenase enzyme coming in contact with oxygen from the surroundings, especially from the air and the water, uh, these heterocysts have a kind of a thick kind of wall. So, there will be no physical contact between this nitrogenase enzyme and the oxygen from the environment. And moving on to the next characteristic, uh, again these cyanobacteria have another kind of special cells known as echinids. These echinids actually act as perinating organisms. They are used to overcome harsh conditions such as droughts, extremely high temperatures, extremely low temperatures. Uh, these echinids actually uh, are found within this uh, uh, cyanobacteria and they are not vegetative cells. They are a special kind of cells and they have a food store within them. So, using this food store, they can perinate and overcome and stay dormant until the harsh conditions are over and then regerminate to produce the cyanobacteria and reproduce the new vegeta vegetative cells and reform the cyanobacteria. Now, the fact is you must remember that uh, these echinids are not reproductive structures because once the uh, cyanobacterium is destroyed, a new uh, cyanobacterium is reformed by this echinid but the number does not increase. In reproduction, the effective number of organisms must increase. But, but, uh, in, the, but in these echinids, the number doesn't increase. It's just the previous cyanobacterium re-germinates and grows after the harsh conditions are over because the previous vegetative cells were destroyed. Uh, regarding the reproduction of the cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria only reproduce through asexual methods. Uh, single unicellular uh, cyan uh, cyanobacteria and colonial non-filamentous types. I said there are two types of uh, filamentous types. So the non-filamentous type and the single unicellular type undergo simple cell division as their asexual mode of reproduction. And uh, while the colonial forms and the colonial unicellular. Now I said that unicellular uh, uh, unicellular uh, cyanobacteria can live as aggregates because when the daughter cells release the mucilage capsule they can be found as aggregates within the mucilage capsule but remember that they are not connected physically to each other their cell walls are not connected there is no physical contact between them they are just found as an aggregate within the mucilage capsule so such colonial unicellular forms and colonial filamentous forms they undergo asexual reproduction through fragmentation next group of uh, organisms are fungi. Uh, singular term is fungus and the plural term is fungi. And talking about fungi, fungi are also a group of eukaryotic organisms like animals us. They are also eukaryotic. There are two main uh, cellular forms of fungi as unicellular and multicellular. The best and well commonly known example for unicellular uh, fungi are yeast or the scientific term is Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast uh, and the uh, multicellular form is the mold the pus what you call pus that forms on bread the black color mold uh, that's a multicellular kind of fungi now these molds that are formed on bread are quite visible black color aggregates and this uh, black mass is known as the mycelium and mycelium gives rise to filamentous structures known as hyphae. They spread like uh, filaments or branches or finger-like projections that move across, that spread across the area and uh, gives rise uh, to new mycelia. The left image shows the arrangement of some hyphae and mycelia in a fungus. So now this hyphae, there are two kinds of this hyphae. Uh, one kind of hyphae have cross walls in it and the other doesn't. Now the hyphae which has the cross walls, uh, they form like small compartments. These cross walls are known as septa, plural, in singular it's septum and they form cross walls throughout this filamentous hyphae. 
this the, so by the action of these cross walls small compartments are formed and each compartment consists of a single nucleus uh, once you look at it it just looks like it, uh, a series of cells have aggregated to form the filament but actually they are not cells they are just compartments giving a cellular appearance uh, having a nuclei in, a, in, nuclei in it uh, then moving on to the other kind of hyphae which does not have cross walls. Once you look at it, it consists of a row of nuclei but does not contain any cross walls. There is no cellular appearance in it like the previous one mentioned. Uh, this special kind of hyphae without the septa or the cross walls are known as xenocytic hyphae. This is what a xenocytic hyphae without cross walls or septa looks like. Uh, regarding the nutrition, fungi are chemoheterotrophs. They are like us. They obtain their energy from chemical reactions and they have organic sources of carbon. Uh, the, they possess a saprophytic mode of nutrition. Now, what's saprophytic? Saprophytic in the sense they uh, have an absorptive sort of nutrition. They extracellularly, di extracellularly digest the nutrients that are present in their organic bodies such as dead animals and plants and using these extracellular enzymes they extracellularly digest the complex molecules and break down them into simpler forms so that other organisms such as plants can freely absorb it and this also is especially very important in maintaining the cycles the food cycles and the natural cycles in the nature because recycling of the environment of the nutrients in the environment is really essential because nutrients are limited and they need to be recycled but after they are incorporated into the bodies of the organisms they must be broken into simpler forms so that it can be reabsorbed by the plants so this decomposition function is done by the saprophytic nutrition mode of this fungi uh, in addition to this chemoheterotrophic mode of nutrition they also have a parasitic mode of nutrition. They uh, act as parasites on animals and plants. For example, athlete's foot fungus. Uh, this forms between the uh, fingers in, of uh, the toes of your leg. And these fungi are parasites. They live on the uh, bodies of animals or can be on plants. And the other form is a mutualistic kind of interaction. For example, lichens and mycorrhizae. Now, here, the, uh, this both kind of lichens, uh, in lichens and mycorrhizae, the both kinds of species are benefited and this is another mode of nutrition that can be found in the fungi. Regarding the reproduction, unicellular fungi reproduce asexually by fission or by budding. And on the other hand, the filamentous fungi, such as the moles, they reproduce asexually and asexually. It, it might reproduce sexually, it might not. If it's sexual reproduction, they use spores to carry out their sexual reproduction. These are two images showing the process of sporulation and budding in two different varieties of fungi. Our next topic will be on molecules. Now, molecules are a group of prokaryotes found under the domain bacteria. There are two basic kinds of molecules as mycoplasma and phytoplasma and these uh, both of these groups are considered to be unique due to their absence of cell wall under domain bacteria so talking about mycoplasma mycoplasma vary in form from like a spherical to filamentous forms and they are the smallest kinds of prokaryotic organisms and they are also uh, invisible to the mi light microscope you need an electron microscope to see this mycoplasma. Uh, mycoplasma do not contain flagella and almost all mycoplasma are parasites of humans and animals. Uh, the nutrition mode of these mycoplasma are uh, from the animals and humans. Mycoplasma require a very uh, high uh, amount of organic growth factors. Now that's the reason why they have a parasitic mode of nutrition. That's why they live on bodies of humans and other animals. 
uh, they reproduce by budding and by nutrition and they do not produce spores. So there is no sexual reproduction in mycoplasma. Uh, the respiratory mode can be either aerobic or they can be facultative and aerobic. Aerobic in the sense they require oxygen to carry out the cellular respiration. Uh, facultative anaerobic in the sense they can uh, live under uh, oxygen defici deficient conditions as well as they can survive under oxygen containing conditions. This is an electron microscopic image of some mycoplasma. Uh, moving on to phytoplasma. They uh, resemble mycoplasma in several many ways. Almost They are almost similar. Uh, they are also similar in size to mycoplasma. So they are also invisible under the light microscope. You need an electron microscope to see the phytoplasma as well. Uh, their shape also varies from spherical to filamentous. Uh, now the difference comes here. Phytoplasma can only infect plants. They cannot infect animals. And they are generally found in the phloem sap. Uh, they cannot grow in artificial culture media and it naturally grows only in the phloem sap. Uh, they are transmitted mostly by the leaf hoppers. Uh, now this happens when the leaf hopper feeds on the phloem sap and it flies and moves to a new tree and when it feeds on the phloem sap of that new tree, the this uh, phytoplasma may enter the phloem sap path of that new tree, so the new tree will get infected. This uh, phytoplasma reproduces uh, when it's within the tree, when it's present within the tree, or it can even reproduce while it's being trans, it's been transferred through the uh, grasshopper within its body. They reproduce by budding and by binary fission, similar to mycoplasma. They also possess a facultative anaerobic or an aerobic kind of respiration, similar to mycoplasma. Now, the difference between mycoplasma and phytoplasma is that phytoplasma uh, only affects and infects plants, whereas mycoplasma infects both humans and animals only. That's the difference between mycoplasma and phytoplasma. These are two transmission electron microscopic images of phytoplasma in the phloem of two different types of plants. So moving on to our next group of organisms, which are the viruses. Uh, actually viruses are neither prokaryotes nor eukaryotes, which means they have no cellular organization. They have no organized cellular organization. Uh, they do not possess any metabolic activities. They cannot reproduce by themselves outside a host cell. Uh, so they are not considered as living organisms actually. However, once they get into a living host cell, it can uh, use the mechanisms of within the host cell and reproduce and form uh, new viruses and release them to the environment. Uh, once they enter this living cell, they cause infection through various metabolic pathways. So this is kind of a characteristic of a living organism. Uh, since viruses can only reproduce or multiply within a living host cell, they are obligate parasites. Uh, the parasite term used here is not based on the mode of nutrition, but uh, their lifestyle where they cannot reproduce without the aid of a living cell. So they are using the living cell, so we call it a parasitic form of interaction. Uh, viruses are very small and they cannot be seen through light microscopes. You need an electron microscope through to see the viruses, mainly because the size of the viruses are in the nanometer range. Uh, viruses possess simple structures. They are usually composed of a central core nucleic acid uh, and uh, uh, surrounded by a protein coat known as the capsid. And this capsid is made up of a fixed number of protein subunits and these are known as capsomeres. Now remember the capsid consists of a fixed number of protein subunits. A specific uh, uh, group of viruses contain a fixed number of protein subunits and these subunits are known as the capsomeres. Viruses may have either DNA or RNA as a genetic material and they never possess both DNA and RNA at the same time in a single variety of viruses. They consist only one type, either DNA or either RNA. Uh, 
they do not have protein synthesis mechanisms such as additional RNAs that are required for protein synthesis as the genetic material or any other uh, protein synthesizing enzymes. Therefore, they depend on the host cell's uh, protein synthesis mechanism. That's why when they enter the new host cell, they first take up the activities of the nucleus and they start producing the viral proteins that are required to synthesize their uh, cellular structures. Uh, some RNA viruses, for example, HIV virus, human immunodeficiency virus, which is responsible for causing AIDS. This uh, virus contains RNA uh, and it also consists of a special type of enzyme known as the reverse transcriptase enzyme. This, the function of reverse transcriptase enzyme, as the name suggests, is it uh, reverse transcribes RNA into DNA. It reforms the new DNA from the RNA. This is a diagram of the human immunodeficiency virus with some of its components labeled. Now talking about the morphology and types of viruses. Based on the architecture of the capsid, the outer cover of the virus, two basic morphological forms can be seen. They are known as helical and icosahedron. And now based on those above symmetries, there are again there are new four types of morphological forms known as helical, polyhedron, complex, and enveloped. Uh, I'm talking about helical viruses now. The helical viruses, uh, the name suggests that it's a long, rigid, or kind of flexible rod. Uh, for example, the rabies virus. The rabies virus is a helical type of virus. The icosahedron or the polyhedral. I said polyhedral before. Another name is icosahedral. Uh, the icosahedral symmetry is found in the adenovirus. Uh, the next category is the complex viruses. The complex viruses, as the name suggests, consist of more than one form of symmetry. It consists of a group of uh, symmetry, not more, uh, several symmet uh, lines of symmetries. In addition, not just one uh, line of symmetry, uh, with additional extra structures. Uh, it has uh, leg-like structures. It has spikes at the bottom. Uh, for example, the bacteriophage virus. Now, this bacteriophage virus is a virus which affects and infects bacteria. They uh, they use bacteria as their host cells for reproduction. Uh, the next group uh, is the enveloped virus. Uh, for example, they are rough. They are roughly spherical, and the capsid is covered by envelopes. For example, the herpes simplex virus. It, uh, the sexual herpes is caused by the herpes simplex virus. These are those four morphological forms of the viruses. Uh, next, we'll talk about the multiplication mechanisms of the viruses. A single virus, a virus can give rise to thousands of uh, new similar uh, kind of viruses in a single host cell at a single time. Therefore, viruses cause very serious damage. It causes a very serious damage uh, at the time after its reproduction because one can form thousands and thousands of new viruses within one host cell. Uh, whereas the host cell uh, most of the time gets destroyed after this uh, multiplication process sometimes. Uh, Bacteria now, as I said before, bacteriophage is a special kind of virus that affects the uh, bacterial cell. It infects the bacterial cell and uh, they multiply by two distinct mechanisms. For example, one is the lytic cycle and the other is the lysogenic cycle. Lytic cycle involves uh, in the lysis of the cell. Lysis in the sense breakdown of the cell. The cell breakdowns after the uh, as uh, as the um, multiplication process takes place within the cell and however the lysogenic cycle allows viral dna incorporate into the host dna the viral dna is added inserted into the host dna and here it multiplies without causing the lysis of the host cell. the host cell remains while the host cell remains the new dna gets multiplied within it uh, now let's talk about the lytic cycle of the bacteriophage virus. Uh, we are considering only this life cycle in according to the national aerial curriculum, uh, and we do not study the lytic. Uh, we do not study the 
lysogenic cycle, we study only the ly lytic cycle of the bacteriophage virus. Now, this bacteriophage virus, the lytic cycle of the bacteriophage virus consists of five main steps. The first is the attachment, the second is the penetration, the third is the biosynthesis, fourth is the maturation and assembly, and fifth is the release. Now, let's go into one, each one individually and discuss the important occurrings that occur under each step. First comes the attachment. The first, this is the first step where the bacteriophage virus detects specific receptors present on the bacteria and it, uh, uh, it mobilizes itself on the receptor side. Now, after, at the, after this mobilization only, uh, the penetration process takes place. Now, when it goes to the second step, which is the penetration, after attachment, the bacteriophage virus uh, inserts and I mean injects its DNA into the host bacterial cell. For this process, the bacterial cell wall must be destroyed. So for the destruction of this, some lytic enzymes are released by the bacteriophage virus and using the sharp spikes at its base, base plate on the bottom, uh, the, bacteria, the bacterial wall is broken down. And then the next step is the biosynthesis stage, uh, where the biosynthesis of the viral DNA and the proteins in the host cytoplasm uh, are uh, done using the host's resources. Host resources in the sense nutrients, the synthesis mechanisms, uh, the, host, the host is used to produce the uh, viral DNA and the proteins, required viral proteins. This stage causes the degradation of the host cell. Now, the reason for the degradation of the host cell is the mechanisms of the host cell are used by the virus. So, there's no uh, mechanisms to run the host cell. So, the host cell gradually is getting destroyed while the viruses are getting created uh, because only the viral proteins and the viral bacteriophage, viral DNA are being produced. Now, uh, this is, called the this is called the degradation of the host cell DNA. Uh, next step is the <coughs> maturation and the assembly. <coughs> Once the bacteriophage DNA and the proteins are synthesized, DNA and the capsids are assembled to form a complete virus. Now, as I said before, the virus consists of DNA proteins and the uh, capsid which is the outer covering. So, before being released to the environment, freed to the environment, they must reform this, uh, uh, reform the new viruses because compart uh, separate parts were formed, and before the release, they should be assembled. Now, uh, assembled and they develop to form complete virus particles, and this is called maturation. That was the fifth step, and the final step is the release. Uh, the release occurs when the bacteriophage induces bacterial cell to break open. The bacterial cell wall breaks open completely; it opens. And then the newly formed bacteriophage viruses are released from the host cell and these released bacteriophages can start another lytic cycle in another cell of the vicinity. So now you might understand, now I said previously that a single cell can give rise to thousands of cells. Now when such thousand cell new viruses are produced and they are released, it will affect another thousand of host cells. So in this way, the multiplication will increase and within uh, for long the host will be affected badly and the host cells will be destroyed. This diagram shows the five major steps of the lytic cycle of the bacteriophage virus. Uh, and then next moving on to uh, the next uh, form of organisms, they are the viroids. Uh, viroids are a group of uh, small organisms. They consist only of a short piece of naked RNA. It's not DNA, they consist only RNA. And this RNA even doesn't have any protective layer or a protein coat. It's just a uh, RNA a molecule. Uh, viruses can only multiply within a living host cell similar to a virus. And uh, it also uses the host cell resources for the replication. However, viroids do not actually contain any genes. They only carry signals uh, for their reproduction 
information is carried in form of signals they do not have genes the virus is only infect plants and there is no information up to date that proves that any other group of organisms are affected by viruses uh, for example potato spinel tuber viroid uh, is an example for a viroid that infects the plants this electron microscopic view shows the image of some viroids and then moving on to the next and the final group of organisms the prions now these prions are a group of proteinaceous infectious particles they are not considered as cells they are just particles uh, they are even smaller than viruses uh, actually, and although th these uh, prions lack nucleic acids they can replicate with the help of the uh, host genes now this there is a specific host gene that encodes the prion proteins once this prion protein is produced proteins are produced the prions can replicate within the host cell and multiply uh, this disease is commonly found among mammals and birds and all these diseases are found to be severe neurological diseases uh, neurological disease in the sense they affect the organs of the nervous system mainly the brain uh, they are actually neurodegenerative diseases uh, for example transmissible spongiform encephalopathies TSEs uh, here large vacuoles develop in the brain there are large uh, spongy like uh, spaces develop within the brain uh, giving a sponge like appearance it kind of eats up your brain and forms a sponge like appearance they are known as TSEs or transmissible spongiform encephalopathies this is an image of a TSE infected brain and the black spots are the vacuoles created by some prions. Another group of prions uh, caused the mad cow disease. This was one of a serious disease found in cattle in 1987. It affected the cattle. And the next is CJD or the Creutzfeldt jacob disease. C-R-E-U-T-Z-F-E-L-D-T Creutzfeldt jacob j a k o b disease c j d and this is one of uh, uh, disease caused by the prions and this affects the humans the brain of humans uh, human to human disease transmission has been uh, found to be associated through the transfusion of blood and tissue now, when blood and tissue are transmitted the virus uh, is transferred to the other human through the blood and during organ implantation uh, some infections may also be trans from, uh, transmitted from the cow to humans such as the TSC which is the transmissible spongiform encephalopathies uh, so thank you very much for watching this video and if you learn something productive from this video and you enjoyed it uh, you may subscribe our uh, youtube channel and click the bell icon and share this uh, youtube channel among your friends so that something productive will be added to your lives and also this would help you to face your ll examination successfully good luck thank you very much